Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the three to five player game Seafall, designed by Rob Davio and published by Ironwall and Plat Hat Games. Across unexplored seas, word has arrived that there are inhabited islands rich with resources that if you collected, would strengthen your province and bring you some glory. Surely the other neighboring provinces are also thinking the same thing. So the time for waiting is over, even if it means risking the age-old peace. In Seafall, there are several game components and even rules that will not be revealed until unlocked over the course of playing the 15 games of the campaign. These hidden elements we will not spoil in this video. Instead, I'm going to give you all the rules required to play the first scenario, the prologue. And then you'll be able to uncover and discover the secrets of the game on your own. And when you encounter new rules, you should be able to properly understand them with the foundation you've gained here. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, have players read the backs of these province boards. You might even enjoy reading them out loud to one another. And this way you'll learn the stories behind each of the different provinces. But you can ignore the final instruction here as you'll be directed back to that when it's time. These are the title cards. In a five player game, randomly deal one to each of the players. With four players, first remove the Lord Lady title, and in a three player game, as we're setting up here, also remove the Baron Baroness. Using the instructions found here, have players sit around the table in the indicated order. Then flip the titles over to see your rank relative to everyone else. Beginning with the player holding the least prominent rank and going in order to most prominent, have each player choose a single province board, along with the two matching ships as shown here. You'll notice there's spaces for the ships and even for the province itself where the player can name them. But don't feel rushed to do this right away. If you prefer to play a couple of turns first and look for inspiration, that's perfectly fine. At this time, a player also chooses any one of these leader cards, which are all the same except for the artwork. You'll now give your leader a name, writing it here permanently in pen, and then you place a sticker in this upper right hand corner from this sheet that matches your province's color. This will remind players of the province that each leader belongs to. Players should note the color and unique symbol of their province and then collect the matching chest. In future games, you may have some items stored in your chest and you'd take those out right now. The game also comes with a general storage chest where certain common items will be kept separately as required. Each player should then collect the enmity tokens that match their province's symbol and place it onto this area of their province board. While unused province boards, chests, ships, and enmity tokens can be returned to the box. This is the game board. Have players put their two boats into the water area of the spaces that match their color and province symbol. Nearby, create a supply for the gold tokens, dice, reputation, and fortune tokens. Each player's leader also indicates a certain number of reputation and fortune tokens that you begin with, so collect those now and keep them beside you. This is the captain's book, and there's also three sheets of stickers. You should keep these handy for use later. These are the milestone cards. Normally, you place any you have into the spaces here along the edge of the board, but for your first game, you'll only place the ones called Prologue. The others you'll put back into the general storage chest along with any unclaimed leaders. These are the treasure cards which you simply place into a face-up stack into this space. You don't need to shuffle them. Each player will have a glory marker in their color and these should be stacked on the zero space of this glory track. This is the target glory token. You'll place it on space 11 for the first game played after the prologue, but we won't need it for this one. Shuffle these damage cards and place them here. Once you unlock other cards, they'll go into the indicated spaces. Speaking of which, I did mention earlier the game comes with several boxes, like this one, which are sealed. Never open these unless you're instructed to. And likewise, never read passages from the captain's book until you're told to. This is the sideboard. Shuffle and place this deck of advisors here. These are the resources representing wood, linen, spice, and iron, and they should all be placed in this area. These are the ship upgrades, as well as structure tokens. Stack duplicates on top of each other, and then, as you see here, assign them all to the matching outline spaces of the sideboard. These are the event cards, which you can place nearby as well. And there are four others, individually labeled and wrapped, which you'll store in the general box until they're called upon in the game. 
These retired advisor stickers can also be stored until they're needed. Also place out this astrolabe and deal a rules reference card to each player. And that's the setup. In this video, you may notice some of the components being moved around or even taken completely off screen. And that's just to make it easier for me to set up the different shots as we're learning this game together. In Seafall, players will be trying to take actions that gain them glory. Glory is how you win individual games, but over the course of several games, you'll add all of your glory together, and the player who has the most by the time the final island is discovered will be crowned the emperor. Individual games are broken into several game years, and those years are broken into a winter phase, and then six individual rounds. So let's begin by learning the winter phase. First, give the astrolabe and the event deck to the player with the least glory. If there's a tie, as there would be at the beginning of a game, then give it to the player with the lowest title. They will then set the astrolabe to one and shuffle the event deck, including any events that were previously revealed. If there are advisors on the track here, you put them on the bottom of the advisors deck and then deal five new ones into these spaces here. These are advisors that players will be able to obtain during the coming round. Players now harvest gaining gold equal to these icons found within fields that they control, like these ones on their province board. In this case, the player would gain eight gold that they'll add to this area known as their vault. If a field has an enmity token on it, it may not be harvested. In this case, the player would now only gain four gold. Now players move opponents' enmity tokens on any of their province board sites to their at war section here. Your sites include these fields, your warehouse, buildings, council room, vault, and your treasure room down here. Enmity tokens will get placed on these sites if your opponent raids your province. At the start of the game, none of these tokens will be in play, and players are not allowed to raid your province during the prologue anyway. But keep this step in mind for future games. Also check all the islands. Each has a dashed line leading to a magnified view of it that are found on the edges of the board. These islands also have sites, which are the various boxes that you'll see. If there are any enmity tokens on an island site at this time, move them to cover the value here, known as the island's garrison. Some sites will show symbols, while others will show a blank color. And over time, more of these blank colors might appear in the form of stickers that get placed on top of island sites. At this time, you'll now place goods from the supply on matching solid colored sites like this one and this brown one over here along with these two. When filling in sites, you may run out of cubes, so fill them from the westmost island to the east in order of highest to lowest defense within an island. Defense values are found within these shields beneath each site. So if we imagine for a moment that this island was made up of all solid color sites, then the one showing a six is the first one we'd fill a cube in, then the one showing a five, and so on. The final step in winter is for players to refresh any exhausted advisors in their council room. That's this area right here. Exhausted means that a card or token is face down. To refresh it simply means you flip it face up. At the beginning of the game, you won't start with any advisors, so the tokens and cards we're using here are just for examples. You also refresh all structures and upgrades that are face down on the sideboard but not face down upgrades on the ships of your province boards. You're reminded of the steps for the winter phase here on the player aid. But after winter, you'll then complete six consecutive rounds, which follow a different pattern. And we'll go over those now. First, at the beginning of one of these rounds, the player with the astrolabe reveals the top card of the event deck, which causes an effect during the round or one to be resolved at the end, as the instructions will indicate. Here, we're told during this round, all ships will have a sail of plus one. Now, beginning with the player holding the astrolabe and going clockwise around the table, each player takes their own full turn. A player's full turn is made up of five steps that you're reminded of here on the player aid and which we'll go over right now. On your turn, you may first either hire an advisor or buy a treasure. For an advisor, you select one from the form here and choose to pay its cost, either in gold or reputation tokens. So for example, if I did want to hire the Savage Advisor, I could either spend three gold or a single reputation, returning it to the supply. You then place the advisor face up into your council room, this area here beside your province board. 
And you give your advisor a name, written here, if it doesn't already have one. Over the course of a game, you can have any number of advisors in your council room, and after hiring, refill the empty space from the top of the deck. In Seafall, this is the symbol for glory. None of the advisors that you can hire at the beginning of the game will provide you with glory, but ones you might unlock later could. When you hire those advisors, look for this symbol and then gain that number of points on the glory track. Instead of gaining an advisor, you may buy a single treasure from this deck, choosing any one of them and then paying the cost here. For example, if I wanted the painted urn, it would cost me 10 gold. However, you may return a single good to the supply from your warehouse that matches its color. So in this case, I'd need to spend spice, and that will reduce the cost of the treasure by eight. Now, it'll only cost me two gold, and collected treasures I would place here in this area known as my treasure room. Keep in mind, you can only spend a single resource for this discount, and the cost of a treasure can never be reduced below zero. After gaining a treasure, you also collect its glory as shown here. In this case, the player in the green province would gain one glory. During the game, any player can examine treasures in this deck or in any other player's treasure room at any time. The next step on your turn is activating an advisor. Now, you may move a face-up member from your council room to the active advisor space here. And while active, you gain its listed benefits. Now we come to the hire a guild step. On the other side of your player aid, you'll see four guilds listed and three actions that each provide. In this step, you'll choose a single guild and then you may perform up to two of their actions in any order, but you may not choose to perform the same action twice. No matter which guild you choose, each provides the option to take a sale action, so let's go over that one first. Quite simply, this allows you to move each of your ships up to their sail value. Your ships come in two different sizes based on their miniatures, and each has characteristics detailed here on your board. The value of each of these abilities is based on the black boxes. So when sailing your ships, this larger one can move up to two spaces, and the smaller one can move up to three. If your ship's sail value is ever reduced to zero, you may still take this sailing action, but you will only move a single space. Let's stop for a moment and take a tour of the map. First, you'll notice it's divided into areas known as spaces. Each of these is known as a home harbor space. This single large space here is known as coastal waters, and the rest of these hexes are open sea spaces, including these ones marked with islands. Though note, if a sea space has nothing printed in it, it's also known as an empty sea space. Spaces printed with islands can contain ships, and ships there can interact with the island, which we saw is shown in greater detail here on the edge of the board. You'll also notice a stone archway here in the ocean, but no one knows its exact purpose. Spaces that contain land, like the islands or your home harbor, are known as regions, and many regions contain marked icons known as sites. Sites with these various symbols are said to be unexplored, but explored ones are often covered up with a sticker. Sometimes an island will also have an effect marked here, which should be taken into consideration while playing. It should be noted that any number of ships may occupy a single space. Also, before or after you sail, if both of your ships are in the same space at a land-based region, you may rearrange goods between their holds here or load and unload them from a warehouse that you control in that region. Moving goods around in this way is something that you can do freely and does not cost you one of your actions. We learned about the sale action found with each of the guilds, but now let's go to the Explorers Guild and learn the Explore action. If at least one of your ships is present at an island, showing at least one of these symbols in a box, then pick one and perform what is known as an Explore Endeavor. Let's say as an example, we chose to explore this site. Now choose one of your ships in the region to be the flagship. Let's say in this case, we choose the larger one. Then take dice equal to the ship's explore value, which, as we see here, is equal to two. We'll learn more about upgrades and damage later, but these may provide you with extra dice to roll or subtract some. In this case, the bold ship upgrade gives you plus one die to roll, which we would add to this pool. If you have another one of your ships in that region and it has a value of at least one in the appropriate stat, you can assign it as a support ship and add one extra die to your roll. Also check your active advisor. If instead we had this one, it would provide an additional two dice for us to roll during an explore action. After creating your total dice pool, 
roll it, and then count your successes. A blank side does not count as a success. Well, this counts as a weak, standard, and strong success, respectively. Also pay attention to any special rules for the island. For example, this one tells us to re-roll any weak successes during endeavors here. So in that case, these two dice would be re-rolled. Now you count any type of successes that you rolled and compare it to the defense value that's shown here on the site that you're exploring. So in this case, we'd like to see at least three successes and we've rolled Four. However, note that after rolling, you may spend any number of fortune tokens, and for each one spent, you can change a single blank side to a standard success. Some sites that you may be trying to explore will have a red shielded background. These are dangerous sites, and you may not spend fortune tokens in this way to modify dice that you've rolled. If the number of successes that you have is less than the site's defense value, your flagship takes damage equal to the difference. As an example, let's say our roll had been slightly less successful. In this case, we only achieved two successes, but the island's defense, again, said that we needed three, so we are one short. For each point of damage, you may do either of the following two options in any combination. One option is to exhaust a ship's upgrade you may have by flipping it over and then losing its benefit. Or you draw and reveal a damage card which you tuck under your ship here. This effect will then take place immediately. In this case, the ship has become mutinous and that means that you must pay two gold for this ship to be part of any future endeavor. If you have two damage, then just make sure the effects of both can be clearly seen. If a ship would gain a third damage card, instead it sinks. So you flip face down and return all upgrades on it to the sideboard, losing one glory for each. If the sunk ship had been holding any goods in its hold, those are then returned to the supply, and the ship itself would be set aside somewhere out of water to indicate that it needs to be repaired. If you did not roll a single success, or if your ship sank from taking damage, then the endeavor is a failure and that guild action ends immediately. Otherwise, you'll succeed, even if you did take some damage. You'll also gain one glory. Also take note of the specific symbol showing at the site you successfully explored. Then examine the explorer's map found here at the front of the captain's book. Pick any symbol matching your site and note the passage number beside it while using a pen to cross off that entry so that it cannot be picked again. Then turn to the corresponding passage in the book and read it out loud, resolving any choices that it gives to you. However, we'll close the book right now without looking closer so we don't spoil any of the surprises. A successful explorer will also instruct you to mark the site with a sticker from this sheet, placing it directly on top of the original symbol at that site. The other action in the Explorer's Guild is research. This is not an option in your first game of Seafall as there are no research cards available, but once there are, you can use this action to pay three gold and draw one. Some advisors will allow you to draw additional research at no extra cost, but either way, you only keep one of those drawn, putting it face up in your treasure room and dismissing the rest. For reference, in the game, dismissing means that you return cards to the bottom of their deck in the order of your choosing. Now let's look at the Builder's Guild actions. With this action, you can either repair or upgrade your ship. To repair a ship, it must be at a region with this hammer symbol like you'd find at your home harbor. You then take this action by refreshing all exhausted upgrade tokens on it and dismissing any of its damaged cards. Instead of repairing, you may choose to buy a single upgrade for a ship in a region with this dock symbol that matches the color of the upgrade you'd like to purchase. Sites like this one show all four of the colors behind it, so any of the colored ship upgrades are available here. Upgrades are the sail-shaped tokens found on the sideboard, and their costs are printed within the circles here in the bottom right-hand corners. To buy an upgrade, it must be face-up. But you may even replace an upgrade you already have on a ship by returning it face down to the sideboard and putting a new one in its place. Instead of paying the full cost for an upgrade, you may also spend one good that matches the upgrade color, either from the ship itself or from a warehouse you control in that region. And this will reduce the upgrade's cost by eight. For example, reducing the bold upgrade from 10 gold to two. 
We'll learn more about enmity tokens later, but essentially they represent acts of aggression you've caused against a location or another province. This island here doesn't have any docks to perform upgrades, but if it did, you would need to add one gold to the cost of your upgrades there for each enmity token of yours that is in that region. Gaining an upgrade provides you with one glory. If you later lose that upgrade, then you lose a glory as well. The other action at this guild is to build one structure, which are the square tokens you'll find here on the sideboard. These show their cost in the bottom right hand corner. And once again, by returning a single good of matching color, you can reduce the cost of a structure by eight. After paying their cost, you place a structure onto a build site like these found on your province board, or you may replace one you already built, returning it to the side board. Building a structure gains a player one glory, and if a structure would be returned to the sideboard, you then lose one glory. During the game, an opponent can offer a player a reputation token, which, if accepted, allows the player to use the effect of a building in that region according to its normal rules of use. For example, if the green player sailed one of their ships into this region, and the blue player accepted a reputation token from them, the green player could take advantage of this marketplace, which means that each good sold in that region gains the player two gold more. Speaking of which, let's learn about the Merchant's Guild. One of the actions here is to buy up to two goods. These purchased goods must be present on sites of an island where you have ships. And each of those goods will cost three gold plus an extra for each of your enmity tokens at that region. So in this case, if I did want to buy the linen here, it would cost me a total of four gold. Goods that you collect are then placed in your hold, which can contain as many cubes as black squares shown here. If you would gain a new good and you don't have room for it, you may discard it or return another one already in your hold to the supply in order to make room. Some advisors like this one will allow you to buy additional goods with this action, but you must still pay their normal cost as usual. Another merchant action is to sell up to two goods. Now you might remember I said earlier that if you have ships in a land region with a warehouse, like the one found here on your province area, you may freely load and unload your ship's goods into it. When you have goods in a region with this symbol, then you can use the merchant action to sell up to two of them. Do pay attention to the colors in the background because this will indicate the types of goods you can sell. In your home harbor, this means you can sell any type of good. And each good that you sell will provide you with six gold. Next, we have the soldier guild actions. To collect taxes, simply take three gold from the supply and add it to your vault. And finally, we have the last action, to raid one site. You can raid another player's province or a previously explored island site, even one that doesn't currently have a good on it. And do remember, you're always allowed to look at another player's collection of treasures and the advisors in their council room, which is especially useful before a raid. But keep in mind, in the prologue game, you may not raid another player's province. Also note that if you already have an enmity token on a site, like we have on this one, then you may not target that specific site with a raid. A raid is an endeavor, so just like when exploring, you'll form your dice pool. Although I said you cannot raid a province during the prologue, we will use invading a province as part of our example here, so you know how it works when you encounter this later. First, you'll gain dice based on the raid value of the invading ship. In this case, we'll say that blue is invading the purple province, and so it will gain two dice. You also gain a bonus die if you have a supporting ship, along with any other applicable bonuses granted by upgrades, advisors, and the like. In this case, we have an advisor who provides us with a bonus three dice during a raid. If you have enmity tokens from an opponent on your at war section, each of those also gives you one extra die to add to your roll when attacking them. You may also lose some dice from your pool. If the region has a garrison value, shown as this symbol within a circle, subtract that number of dice along with any garrison values you may find on structures in this region. So in this case, we'd lose a total of two dice. When raiding an island site, these also have garrison values as well. You'll also lose one die for each of your enmity stickers found in this area here of a province or on an island here if that's where you're targeting. If you're raiding a player's province as we're doing here, then you also lose a die for any enmity tokens of yours that you have anywhere on sites found on their province board. In this example, we would have raided one of their fields earlier in the game and they haven't forgotten, so they're ready for us and we lose a die. Each ship in the region controlled by 
by the player who is the target of your raid subtracts one from your dice pool as well. After rolling your dice pool, determine your damage as usual using the defense value. In a province, it's shown right here. So let's say we managed to roll three successes. This raid would then cause two damage to our ship, which we would take by exhausting upgrades and or drawing damage cards. Assuming you've rolled at least one success and you haven't sunk, you now gather your plunder. We'll look first at the results of plundering a province and then afterwards we'll go over successfully plundering an island. After a successful raid on a province, you may plunder a single site on an opponent's province board like this one. Sites are any area labeled with one of these plunder values, but you may only plunder a site where the number of your successes is equal to or higher than its plunder value. So in this example raid where I achieved three successes, the sites that I could target would be these ones here. You'll notice I have enough successes for the plunder value in this field, but there's already an enmity token here, so I cannot raid it again. We'll go over the benefits of targeting these different sites, but once you gain that benefit, you place a number of your enmity tokens there equal to that site's plunder value. So a blue player raiding the purple player's warehouse would then place three enmity tokens in that space. Keep in mind, you cannot plunder a site if you do not have enough enmity to place there. In fact, this is true in general. If any action would require you to spend more enmity than you have, then you cannot take that action. If a series of events forces a player to lose enmity that they do not have, the player instead loses one glory per token they could not spend. Also note, before placing your own enmity tokens in an opponent's site that you're plundering, you first need to check the at war section of your own province board as we're doing here for the blue player. If you're attacking the province of an opponent that you have enmity tokens from in your at war section, then instead of placing your own tokens during plunder, you first remove one of your opponent's enmity tokens in your at war section in place of each token you would have needed to add. You then continue placing your own tokens as required. You can think of this as leveling the score for an opponent's past aggressions, because that's how these tokens end up in your at war section in the first place. It's because at some point previously, they attacked you. When removing their tokens, return it to their personal supply. Now let's go over the benefits of raiding the different sites found in a province. If you raid a field, you gain the gold value shown here, and the field will not produce gold for its controlling player during their next winter harvest. You're reminded of this by the enmity tokens that will be placed there. In fact, because this field has a plunder value of two, two tokens would be located in this space when it's raided. If you plunder a structure, it is returned to the sideboard exhausted, and you either take a single good from the supply matching the structure's color, black in this case, or gold equal to half its cost. This also forces its controlling player to lose one glory. If you raid a player's vault, you take half the gold from it, rounding up. If instead you raid the council room here, this allows you to move any advisor there to your own council room, refreshing it if it had been face down. You may also dismiss the advisor instead of taking it, but either way, if the advisor had provided glory when it was originally gained, its original owner loses that glory, and if you took the advisor, then you gain it. Raiding a warehouse allows you to take half the goods there rounded up. Finally, if you raid the treasure room, take one card from it and refresh it if necessary and add it to your treasure room, subtracting its glory from the original owner and giving it to the new owner. However, no matter what kind of plundering is done, a player always gains one glory for a successful raid endeavor. If the target of your raid was an island site, which is allowed during the prologue, as long as you rolled at least one success, you gain a plunder based on the type of site. Then you put one of your enmity tokens on that location. If the site you're raiding is one that produces a good, you gain one good of that type that's sitting there. If the site is empty when you raid it, you take a good of that type from the supply. However, if there's none of that type in the supply, you cannot raid that location to begin with. The other types of sites you can raid, you won't see until you start stickering the island. So let's go to the sticker sheet and we'll go through them that way. If the location shows a mine like these, then you take gold from the supply equal to their values. If the site has a market symbol, like these ones here, you take up to two goods that match its background color from the supply. If none of those goods exist, then you can't raid that site. It's worth mentioning, when raiding either an island or a province, gold you gain goes into your vault, while goods must be placed in the hold of ships at that location 
respecting hold limits. If the site has one of these dock symbols, then take a ship upgrade worth 10 gold, but don't actually pay anything for it. However, the upgrade must match the background color on the sticker itself. In addition to raiding sites, you'll later be able to raid ships, but the rules for this are hidden initially, so you'll have to wait to unlock it to learn how that works. So those are all of the guild actions that you can take on your turn, and after completing a guild action, you may claim a single milestone from here if you've met its requirements. You then resolve any of its listed instructions, keeping in mind that you may only claim one milestone in a turn, and if you would be eligible to complete two of them, you may choose which one you'd like. Sometimes though, claiming a milestone after your first action may instruct you to end your hire a guild step for going your other guild action. In the prologue scenario, any time any player reaches a multiple of three glory, have them fill in the namespace on any unnamed island on the board. Then they take the appropriate milestone and read aloud its entry in the captain's book. The last step in a player's turn is to exhaust any active advisor they might have by flipping it face down and moving it to their council room. After all players have taken their turns in a round, double check the event card to see if it would activate at this time, and then dismiss it to the bottom of the event deck. In games after the prologue, you'll now check the glory track to see if any player's game glory equals or exceeds the glory target. If so, this game is over, and we'll discuss what happens then in just a moment. Otherwise, you advance the astrolabe one spot. If this moves it to winter, the year is over, and you begin a new year, starting with a new winter phase. If, however, it shows a number, then you play another round. Players will continue resolving rounds and winter phases until the game ends, which happens at the end of a round when at least one player has reached or exceeded the target glory marker. The player with the most glory then wins. If there's a tie, then the tied player with the least prominent title wins. In the prologue, there is no target glory marker, and instead the game ends when the last milestone is collected. At the end of a game, you'll perform seven steps. The first step is only performed by the player who just won the completed game. They may now take the improvement sticker sheet and choose one reward from it. For example, you can improve a field, choosing one that you control and replacing it with the next highest gold-valued sticker here. Or you can improve a garrison on a region you control by stickering it with the next highest value. Or improve either reputation or fortune on your leader by one step, updating its value with one of these stickers. Or they can take any of these appellations and place them on their leader, stickering over any previous one that might already be there. All of the players will participate in the next step, and they'll take their turns in order from lowest glory gained in that game to the highest, with ties being broken in favor of the player holding the lowest title. First, each player picks one of these retired advisors to train an advisor that they control. You might not be able to tell, but these are made up of three separate stickers. So you take the topmost sticker and then place it into a free space of one of your advisors. Each player must pick a unique retired advisor unless they have no advisors under their control with empty slots, in which case they'll just skip this step. This also means in future games, if you pick a retired advisor that was chosen in a previous game, the top sticker will be gone, so the upgrade that you get will be a little better. Also note, if an advisor has two or more of the same types of benefits, you total their values when playing for a combined effect. Also, when the final sticker on a retired advisor is removed, you can destroy that blank card, removing it from the game. In the next step, each player chooses one advisor that they control to place in their personal chest and keep for the next game. However, the player who won the game may only keep an advisor if its gold value here is lower than any of the advisors kept by any of the other players. So let's pretend for a moment this player was the winner, and amongst the other players, the lowest advisor kept had a gold value of 2. This would mean the only advisor the player here could keep would be the woodsman who has a lower gold value. This also means the winning player may be unable to keep an advisor depending on the gold values of the ones they control. Next, players may improve one of their ships by using a pen to fill in a single white square on any boat that they control. Now each player rolls as many dice as they have fortune and reputation tokens remaining. You may then use each success to take back one of your enmity tokens from any region and or you may use pairs of successes to cross out with a pen any of your enmity stickers on regions. These are the stickers found on this sheet that will sometimes get placed into these areas of the board. 
Crossed out, MDD spaces are considered empty, meaning new stickers can be placed over them. Speaking of which, if players do have remaining MDD tokens in a region, those are now replaced with those permanent MDD stickers in that region on those spaces. Then the tokens are removed and returned to the controlling player. Note that new stickers are always placed first in empty or crossed out spaces, but if the slots are all full, you then choose a sticker that is not yours to cover over. If all of the slots are full with your own stickers, then you instead lose one glory for each enmity sticker you cannot place. Though the game is still considered over, even if this causes a player to drop below the target glory value. The next step is to record each player's glory from the current game into this historical record found on the back of the rulebook. The first game's scores are placed along this row. And then after the second game, you record the game's scores in this upper half of the space, and then add those points to the player's previous total to create an updated campaign glory that you enter into the bottom half. Players should also record the milestones that were completed and who gained them into the spaces here. You'll notice that the target glory you must achieve to win each future game is also indicated on this record. Finally, you reassign titles to players based on their campaign glory total, giving the most prominent title to the player with the most glory down to the lowest title for the player with the least glory. If there's a tie, the player with the least prominent rank in the game that you're concluding chooses which title they want. Between games, players should store their leader, title, kept advisor, as well as enmity and glory token in their province chest, along with any other components that would carry over. But do note, gold or goods that you've collected, or upgrades and structures that you've built, are not carried over from game to game. Players continue playing games until the island at the end of the world is discovered, which usually takes around 15 games. The player with the most recorded campaign glory then wins and becomes emperor of all the lands. If there's a tie, the tied player who completed the most milestones wins, and if there's still a tie, the tied player with the least prominent title in the final game wins. And that's everything you need to know to play Seafall. At the back of the rulebook, you'll also find some tips for how to add or remove a player from a campaign that's already started, and simply how to deal with a player who maybe has to miss one of your gaming sessions of your campaign. But otherwise, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. That said, if you have questions about rules that get introduced as you unlock new components in the campaign, I'd request that you ask those over at the Plat Hat Games website because that's where I'll be going if I have any questions. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.